insofar as the Zionist part was concerned, well, yes, he, he became at the Hebrew University for some years, he was first, well, I, I was going to say he was uh, the, the most outstanding, the most controversial Israeli Jewish critic at the university. These are the fires of hatred that are also jumping from country to country. And like I said, I don't think it's a coincidence that they are raging at the same time and that these two fires are fueling each other. Because it's also not a coincidence that many of these authoritarian figures deny the reality of climate change and the pitting of populations against each other frees them up for the true business at hand, which is raiding the last remaining pieces of wilderness. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. I'd like you to take a look at two charts. The first shows a milestone. It's the number of deaths in the U.S. from the coronavirus compared to the number in China. I got the figures from Statista. The milestone is that our great country has had 10 times as many deaths from the virus as they had in China. But as bad as that is, consider that China has a lot more people than the U.S., about a billion more people. So look at this chart, the number of deaths per million people. The comparison now is staggering. And we pay far, far more for health care and sanitation than, than does China. Now, I, I know some of you are saying the Chinese government lies. Well, maybe, but they did reopen the virus epicenter in Wuhan, so they couldn't have lied very much. Does the corporate media ever compare the U.S. and China? Not in the coronavirus. Instead, they show people the latest fool idea that the Chinese invented the virus to bring America to its knees or they show us the hundreds of bigger fools who will go out in public without even a mask or physical separation and stand up for their right to do whatever they like, whenever they like, no matter what it means for everyone else's health. A quick announcement. Swati Birla and Abdul Basit Khan will talk about the troubles of Muslims in India and Kashmir. Sunday afternoon, April 26, see rpm.world for details. I'm going to show part of an interview I did with retired Professor Norton Vesvinsky, where we talk about his friend and political associate, Israel Shachak. Shachak died in 2001. He was a giant, an Israeli professor who stood up for human rights for everyone, particularly Palestinians. He was a professor of chemistry at Hebrew University with knowledge in many, many fields. He even had a popular radio program where he discussed and played music. To give you a flavor of the man, here's a bit of an interview I did with him 30 years ago. It's a five-minute segment where we talk about the first intifada, when masses of Palestinians fought back for the first time, mostly with stones, and where the Israeli prime minister of the time openly called for the stone throwers to be seized and to have their arms broken. And this, and worse, was done routinely. deal of that on the Western, in the U.S. TV and in the papers, but there's very, very little now, but it hasn't stopped. No, it didn't stop. Uh, well, this is the nature of the media. If you don't feed them with uh, new information, if you don't help them, they get interested in other, in other areas. There is East Europe, there is South Africa. Um, it is media are maybe to some extent to blame, but those who should have helped them are more to blame. 
in the beginning we heard about breaking the hand so people couldn't throw stones, but it has gotten more than that, isn't it? Breaking they the are hand. breaking uh, bones of the hands of the uh, and of the legs, kneecaps and so on, ribs. Everything continues as it was at the beginning. Administrative detention. There's th how many people in, are in this kind of uh, detention? It is difficult to make a statement because the things are, ch are completely changing. I would say that not counting holding ins uh, installation and not counting people who have been properly sentenced, they are in administrative detention, some nine to 10,000 people at present. When, and these are people who are not put on trial, not And those with, yeah, exactly. When we complained about this to the Israeli authorities, we got a long letter back uh, saying that they do this only to protect informers and that there's an elaborate appeal process that works, that 28% uh, 20, of the appeals get some improvement uh, in their condition. Uh, what do you think of these? I think that it's, well, it is useless to complain to Israeli authorities in the first place. You should complain to you, to American authorities about this. But of course, um, the Israeli authorities are were very well known as lying uh, if they can escape from it. I think that this is uh, that what you told me is now a string of lies. There is some appeal process, but I don't believe that 23% uh, uh, are being, um, uh, have some improvement. This, uh, the appeal process uh, is being by nominated military commission, meaning the same authority which issues the order in the first place uh, is also nominating uh, the, the so-called appeal commissioners. The very minimal request that there will be independent appeal authority, meaning, let's say, retired Israeli judges or uh, something like this, has not been followed now for 23 years, including the Intifada. There is no improvement and there will never be so long as the present system will remain. His advice is still right. The goons who run Israel have no interest in your appeals to humanity or logic. But they do respond to outside pressure, particularly BDS. Now to some of the interview with Professor Mezvinsky about Shachak. Morton Mezvinsky rose to the post of Distinguished Professor of History at Central Connecticut State University. He co-authored with Shachak Jewish Fundamentalism in Israel. I don't know if you told me or someone else that even though politically he was kind of a pariah in Israel, he always was voted a top teacher at the university because they liked the way he taught. Yes, that's right. Well, really, what happened, there are two areas to that, two areas that you just mentioned. One is he became very popular because uh, he was he was such a good lecturer and teacher of chemistry, that's one thing, which he did, and he worked with uh, a very famous nuclear scientist who was the chair of the chemistry department named Bergman, uh, who loved him and so on, even though politically their views were totally opposite, but that didn't matter. Mm. Uh, so he had all of that, but then, and then, then he also developed in other ways, uh, good relationships, you know, when he would talk about other things as well. So there was the chemistry part. Now, insofar as the Zionist part was concerned, well, yes, he became, uh, I mean, he became at the Hebrew University for some years, he was first, well, I, I was going to say he was uh, the, <laughs> the most outstanding, the most controversial Israeli Jewish critic at the university. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, it may be a bit of an exaggeration. He wasn't that all the time he was there because then there were others. So I mean, in terms of the anti-Zionism, there, there were a few at the Hebrew University who were also of that ilk, of which he was one. But he was the one who, uh, in these earlier years, in these earlier years, and by earlier years, I mean right through the 1970s, 
uh, and even into the early 80s, he was the one who probably was the most famous of the anti-Zionists and the most hated. Mm. And he, he joined the Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights sometime after the Six-Day War. Can you talk about that group? Uh, yes, he was the, he became the chairman of the Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights in 1970. Mm -hmm. And he remained the chairman until 1990. Now, when he joined, most of the people, most of the people were um, uh, people from Rakach, uh, the Communist Party in the Knesset, which was the anti-Zionist party, as you know. And that party was made up, that party was made up as Shachach then made up the Israeli League for Human Civil Rights. It was made up of 50% Arabs. They couldn't quite have 50%. They didn't have so many in the Knesset. Uh, but it was made up of Arabs, of Palestinians, and Israeli Jews. So when Shachach set up the Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights, he made as sure as he could that it always had an almost equal number of Palestinians and Israeli Jews. So yeah, and um, uh, they, by the way, that, that Israeli League for Human and Civil Rights, as you know, uh, they of course, uh, for a long time, they were, uh, that was a major group that in Israel um, uh, spoke out for uh, uh, the Palestinians and violations of human rights and so on. But they didn't limit themselves totally to Palestinians. They also uh, talked about uh, violations of human rights to Jews at times and mm -hmm. so on. So anyway, but he was the chair for 20 years. And at some point he started writing, uh, rather translating major articles in the Hebrew press and sending it out to friends and associates. Do you know when that started? Yeah, yeah. That? Well, not only do I know when, but actually Israel Shahak and I are the ones who started it. And he would do most of the translation. I'll tell you how we started it. We started it in the 70s, late 70s. And I went to a friend of mine who had a uh, top position in the National Council of Churches. And he, he was a Quaker, and he was involved with American friends from the Middle East. And so he was sort of, you know, in the, uh, in the grouping. Um, and he was interested. So actually, I got him to finance this to begin with. So actually, those translations, we did those translations. Shachach did most of them. We did them. And we printed them up at the National Council of Churches. And that's where they were sent out. From They sent out by National Council of Churches for a long time. And lots of people got them. But those really became known as, correctly, they became known as the Shachach Papers. And they were what they were. They were, that's right. You were exactly right. They were translations from the Israeli Hebrew press uh, that had to do, of course, with uh, Israeli Palestinian affairs, relations, and so on. And, and they would have an, a nice little introduction, almost always, sometimes oh, very acid comments about some. That's people. right. That's right. He, he, that's right. He did it. Yes. That's exactly right. And then there'd be and footnotes sometimes too, and he would elaborate on some point and put he a would zinger on here. Who got them? Yes, of course. Uh, we look, I look forward to getting them every whenever. They were terrific. They were terrific. Yeah. Now I want to talk about another aspect of his life, uh, his critique of uh, Orthodox Judaism back in, uh, let's see, I, I forget the year, but he writes a letter to Haaretz, and he said that he witnessed this outrageous situation where someone tried to uh, use a telephone of an Orthodox Jew on a Sabbath to uh, call an ambulance because someone, uh, a non-Jew, had been injured 
And the Orthodox Jew said, oh, it's a non-Jew? No, I'm not going to violate the, the, um, the uh, sanctity of the Sabbath for that. Did he talk to you about that? He does answer that question in a way I did not expect. To see the whole interview, go to our website, thestruggle.org, and click on YouTubes. Before we leave Israel, a photo of Rabin Square in Tel Aviv, a demonstration of 2,000 people on April 19th against the Netanyahu government, a last-ditched attempt to convince the former general and war criminal Gantz and his followers to not join in Netanyahu's government. It didn't work, but the demonstration is remarkable for bringing a lot of people together while still keeping them physically separate. Now to the conclusion of Naomi Klein's talk at Harvard University, the closing section of her speech after accepting the Rushdie Award given out by several Harvard humanist organizations. I don't think it is a coincidence that at the same time that the reality of this crisis ceases to be something that we're talking about you know, far, you know, a, a generation into the future, or something we're worried about for our kids, but becomes a banging down the door crisis, that we are also seeing the rise of, of authoritarian figures around the world. Trump is one. Modi is another. Duterte is another. Um, there are many of these figures around the world, and they kind of they share a playbook. They trade worst practices. They like each other. They have rallies together. I'm not saying they are the same, um, but there is a there, but there is a rise of supremacist logics around the world, right? It, in this country, in Europe, it is white supremacy. It is a system that says these people will be protected and these people will not be. And we will call them animals in that great chain of being and we will say that that is why it is okay to let them drown in the Mediterranean or let them die in the desert or separate their kids and send them, and, and, and send them to, into camps. It requires the supremacist logic in order to do it. It is not a coincidence that these logics are rising in this moment where they are being used to rationalize barbaric responses to unprecedented human migration. Everybody knows we're going to see more of this. And I'm not saying the migration is all connected to climate change, but it is one of the major drivers. And it's layered on top of all the other you can't, uh, drivers. You can't pry them apart. And so, you know, I think this, th this rise of these, uh, of, of these of these figures who use different supremacist logic, and Modi uses Hindu supremacy, and we're seeing pogroms in India right now, right? Is that it creates rationales for the hierarchies that are being created in these countries. Modi is in the middle of stripping citizenship to millions of Muslims in India. This is not a coincidence. There are different ways that we can rise to this crisis. We can either come together, recognize all of each other's humanity, or we can we, or we, we will see much more of this descent into supremacy or different kinds of supremacy, religious, racial, you name it. And we will say we will protect ours and we will hoard for our in-group and we will use these logics to rationalize these barbaric acts. And they are tapping into different feelings of insecurity. Some of them are ecological. We know our house is on fire, whether or not we're conscious of it or not. It's not possible to be at this stage in this crisis and not on some level understand that our collective home is in crisis. But we also are dealing with the legacy of four decades of economic policy that has attacked people's standards of living, that has made, that have made people feel more precarious because it, it attacks job security, it attacks social programs. <coughs> And it, and, and it becomes much easier to prey on people's feelings of these different kinds of insecurities, this sort of existential ecological insecurity as well as economic insecurity. Um, so these are the fires of hatred that are also jumping from country to country. And like I said, I don't think it's a coincidence that they are raging at the same time and that these two fires are fueling each other. 
because it's also not a coincidence that many of these authoritarian figures deny the reality of climate change, and the pitting of populations against each other frees them up for the true business at hand, which is raiding the last remaining pieces of wilderness um, for the fossil fuels in the Arctic or the trees in the Amazon, in the case of Bolsonaro, another one of these guys. So the good news is our fire. <laughs> that there really is a shift that is going on here. And you know, when I say we need to be life that is defending itself, there is something extraordinary going on in this country, in the largest economy in the world, where we, we are seeing a sea change in the nick of time in public opinion, where there is an appetite, particularly among young people, for precisely the kind of deep change that is required to face this crisis. But in order for us not to blow this moment, a moment when you know, the, in these presidential primaries, we are seeing not one but two progressive candidates with Green New Deal plans, um, with broad support. You know, if we don't blow this, if we don't split the vote and make room for an oligarch to seize the reins, um, we could actually have what the IPC told us we need to have, which is fundamental transformation in every aspect of society, which is actually a plan to put both of those fires out at the same time, because it attacks the economic precarity. It tells people, you don't need to choose between a job and a healthy planet. You don't need to choose between the end of the world and the end of the month, as the Yellow Vest Movement in France said. You care about the end of the world. We care about the end of the month. A Green New Deal says, actually, we all have the right to care about both. And here's a plan that is going to give you universal health care and housing and child care. And it's also going to reduce emissions in line with what scientists are saying. That's how you build a broad-based movement that's going to have buy-in, that's going to give people enough economic security that maybe we won't turn on each other and become our worst selves as we face this crisis. So it's worth remembering that fire, when it is not the sort of twisted misuse of fire that comes from digging up things we shouldn't have dug up, or at least so many of them. Fire is a life-giving force. Um, there would be no life on Earth without the ball of fire in the sky. Um, indigenous peoples have used fire for millennia, um, understanding that it clears away debris, dead wood, creates ash that is fertilizer for the soil, it makes room for new growth. And so I think we need to remember and harness that, um, that kind of energy in a moment like this and, and, <coughs> and burn away the resistance that, that, that we have in ourselves, uh, that we have in this culture that is still clinging um, to ways of knowing and ways of thinking that do not fit the era that we are living in. We happen to be living <laughs> in frankly the last window when it is possible to protect life on a truly unimaginable scale. So the young people um, in the UK who joined the, the student climate strike movement, they say Greta, who has a lot of fire in her, they say Greta was the spark, but we are the wildfire. Um, and I, and, you know, and I, I see that spreading in all kinds of ways. Um, it's certainly present in the fossil fuel divestment movement, which is very, very powerful here at Harvard. Um, and you know, it's been eight years <laughs> that people have been pushing this institution to divest from fossil fuels. And I believe it will come. It's a little embarrassing that BlackRock might do it first. Um, <laughs> but we've seen some really, really big progress. I have hopes for you at Harvard. And, but, and as, as, I, but as I finish, I'm just going to tell you one story. When we launched the fossil fuel divestment movement, I was part of launching it when I was on the board of 350 with my dear friend Bill McKibben. We read the report, um, the carbon tracker report that talked about unburnable carbon. That, that we had five, that the fossil fuel companies had five times more carbon in their proven reserves than is compatible with the temperature targets our governments had set at the time, two degrees, let alone 1.5. And so this was a warning to shareholders. They were saying, look, there's all, there are all these assets. They're going to be stranded assets. It's going to be a market crash. And Bill and I read this report and we were like, actually, I think, I think they're going to burn it. <laughs> 
And, 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 and that's the problem. Like we can't count on them not to burn it unless we create the counter pressure. And so that was the idea for the fossil fuel divestment movement. And we kicked it off about eight years ago. And it has changed the game in lots of ways because the moral argument is being made by young people um, and by faculty um, that these are unethical businesses, that their business model is at war with life on earth. And that creates a context where we now have you know, the vast majority of candidates running for president for the Democratic Party who have had to sign a pledge saying that they won't take fossil fuel money. That's all the work that the, fossil, that the, that the student divestment movement has done, whether or not you have gotten your school to divest, because you've been part of building this moral argument that is already changing politics in this country and around the world. But that said, I will say, we modeled the fossil fuel divestment movement um, after the, the, the divestment movement uh, that targeted companies that were invested in South Africa during the apartheid era. Um, and that was one of the most successful div uh, divestment movements of all time. Um, and, um, and obviously it's not the reason that that apartheid ended, but it was one tool in a toolbox, right? It was one key pressure point. <clears throat> Now, it went on for a long time, it, you know, it went on for, uh, you know, universities were doing it for a decade before it finally worked. Um, now, I went to university in 1989. I was in my first year university and I was just getting started and somebody asked me to go to a protest and I, and I went. It was the first student protest I ever went to. Um, and it was an occupation of the, the president's office at University of Toronto where I went to school. We occupied the president's office and we demanded that University of Toronto divest um, from South Africa. We had a lot of South African investments. Um, and two weeks later, Nelson Mandela walked free from prison. Um, and so, so I did it, essentially. And, and I, <laughs> so I believe that Harvard is going to, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be the last one to fall, maybe, or one of the last but it's going to be the real breakthrough. So we're counting on you. And thank you for all your work. <laughs> Before we go, wherever you live, join the virtual rally on Saturday, April 25th against three global menaces, a Connecticut fracked gas plant, pipelines like the KXL, and governments that refuse to release prisoners in this time of pandemic. That's our program for today. Stay safe, but stay active. See you next week on The Struggle.